Okay, so very good evening and well, once more welcome to this lecture of Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was actually in uh, for some audio problems. So I think somebody who is listening to this lecture that can just put up in a comment box whether my audio is visible. I just checked that, yes, the audio is now audible. I'm so sorry. So we will start, uh, I mean to say, where we actually left, that we learned about general theory as a classical theory. What are the limitations of classical theory? Why general theory is called a classical theory? And based on that, what are the predictions that we see in general theory of relativity? And most importantly, what we found is that general relativity is more of the geometry of space-time rather than what is called uh, the pure mathematical part. I mean to say it basically covers up mostly about the geometry part. So the geometry is taken care and uh, how things evolve from geometry. What are the components we have just uh, taken care of that? Overall, I can tell you we just covered the initials of general theory of relativity. So in today's lecture, what I would like to show you is that because general theory of relativity comes from you can see a modification or an extension whatsoever about special theory of relativity, which is the predecessor of general theory of relativity. So we really need to know that what is the reason behind the evolution of special relativity. Without special relativity, general theory of relativity would not have been possible. So we will look into those aspects and we will try to find out what was the problem and how we found out the general theory of relativity. So as you can see here that the word annus mirabilis is taken from the Latin word, which means miracle year, are the four papers that Albert Einstein published in Annalen der Physik, which is a German scientific journal, which means Annals of Physics. It was published in 1905. These four papers were major contributions to the foundation of modern physics. First, as you can see, that the first paper explained what is called the photoelectric effect. And uh, this is actually which uh, won uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics for um, Einstein, uh, that which established energy of light quanta. And second, as you see, the equation is basically a Brownian motion, which led people during that time to accept the existence of atoms. The third one is where he introduced special theory of relativity uh, using the universal constant speed of light and to derive what is called the Lorentz transformations. And the fourth one is a famous, or you might call infamous, uh, the mass energy equivalence expressed in the famous equation equal to mc square, which led to the discovery of atomic energy decades later. So what it shows as these four papers together with quantum mechanics and Einstein general relativity are the foundations of modern physics. So we say these are, I mean to say relativity, quantum mechanics and classical theory, these are actually what uh, is uh, makes the entire foundation of that. So from here, what we see is that the special theory of relativity actually, uh, I mean to say the postulates can be divided as you can see right now on the screen. So it says that the laws of physics are invariant. That means in all initial frames of reference, uh, it is uh, with no acceleration, it would remain identical. The second part tells that the speed of light in vacuum is the same for all observers. That means the motion of the light source are observed. Now, this one, the laws of physics will are invariant and the speed of the light uh, is same for all. Actually, it comes, the speed of the light actually comes from a certain, certain kind of an experiment, which we will look into it. But whether the laws of physics are invariant or not, that actually comes from what we call the Galilean transformation. And we will see that earlier to post uh, pre-relativity also, uh, the physicists tried to find out something where even in there is there a, if there is a change in the frames of reference, yet the laws of physics will remain the same. So this is a kind of a chronology of events which developed. Initially, although Isaac Newton based his physics on absolute time and space, he also adhered to the principles of Galilean relativity uh, Galilean relativity actually tells that all observers in initial motion are equally privileged and to prefer and to prefer to that state of motion can be attributed to any particular initial observer. 
Also, there was an existence of what is called a luminiferous ether, that is a kind of a you know, unknown substance. And it was thought that during that time, gravity, electricity, magnetism, all those things actually permeate and travel through that luminiferous ether. Maxwell's equations, although uh, it was developed during that time, Maxwell even thought that his equations are the transformation of electromagnetism, electric and magnetism, it was not electromagnetism, also moves through the ether. So ether was thought as some kind of a substance uh, which will responsible for transmission and the medium through which the transmission actually happens. Here you see this, these are a few of the developments which happened. Michelson Molly uh, experiment actually discarded the theory of ether. Uh, I am not going to explain too much about the Michelson Molly experiment because it is quite well known that if the earth moves around this, then the ether would create a kind of a whirlwind. And if the light is passing through that, then there will be sufficient low in the terms of the speed or velocity of the light, which was not found. Lorentz actually started working to develop a theory of electrodynamics, but it is worth mentioning that even prior to Lorentz, there is a French uh, uh, famous mathematician and physicist, Henri Poincaré, who actually formed what is called Poincaré group. And this Poincaré group is something which is much earlier to Lorentz transformation. Now, as you understand that always history doesn't account the original creator. So it happened with uh, Poincaré also, although he uh, framed something which is similar to uh, uh, Lorentz transformation, but it was not accepted. And it was Lorentz who actually formed and later Albert Einstein's published the original paper. And in special relativity, he independently derived and radically reinterpreted what is called the Lorentz transformation in terms of the definition of space and time intervals. So this is actually the development of special theory of relativity, starting from the notion of ether, etc. Now, herein comes the question that why do we need a special relativity? As I have I always been telling that in order to define a particular theory, we need to have a limitations of a particular theory. If the theory doesn't have a limitation, then it becomes difficult that why we have formed that, uh, I would say, theory. Uh, it is just not out of the blue that we just want to create a theory and we want to create a theory. So uh, I was, uh, you know, talking to Professor Abhirub Datta, and he told, uh, he came in a live uh, streaming regarding astronomy and astrophysics. So somebody, a subscriber, put up that what could be an original, uh, better theory than general theory of relativity. So Professor Datta smiled and told that, do we need an original theory? Do we need an alternative theory to gravity? So the question is very fundamental that if we do not need a theory, it is just not there are many other works to do. Why do we? suddenly find out a theory. So that is what comes in terms of special relativity, that why do we need a special relativity? So I will just to quickly sum up, although the writing is a little bit messy. The first thing is that what is called the invariance of the speed of light, that is experimental result contradicted classical physics, actually which assumed that the speed of light would vary depending, as I told you, if the light travels to the ether medium, then definitely it is going to vary. But experiments for michelson molly experiment told that there is nothing called ether and there is no variation in terms of the change of the speed of light. Now, the question is that if there is no variation in terms of the speed of light, that means the speed of light is constant. Now, Maxwell's equations and the classical electrodynamics, remember, I'm talking of electricity and magnetism because it is not united into electromagnetism till that time. So it was uh, it was finding a discrepancy how uh, it would be do it would be done. So it was also not clear that how the consistency of the speed of light, which was disregarded by Michelson Molly's experiment, the existence of ether, can be reunited with classical mechanics because classical mechanics and the principle of Galilean relativity, which assumed that the physical laws are the same for all observers in motion. It is now showing that it is the same for all observer motion, but there is something which is called the constancy of the speed of light. So how it would be reconciled? I'm going to say these, see, these are obstacles, questions. And until a physics or the world faces a question, there is no need to find a new theory. Second, uh, third is that I already told you Michelson Molly's experiment, which predicted that there is nothing called an ether. So what we found here is that there is an inadequacy of Newtonian mechanics. That means Newtonian mechanics was inconsistent 
with something which is traveling higher than the or close to the speed of light. Now, whenever we uh, do any kind of a calculation of motion, especially in classical mechanics or any other mechanics, what we try to find out is that we try to find out something which is uh, fast or something which is uh, moving at a very fast rate. So Newton's laws of motion, whatever the speed or velocity that you would like to accelerate, was defining the laws of motion quite perfectly. But when we saw that it is closing to the speed of light, 3 lakh 86,000 miles per second, whatever the speed and velocity, that is where the laws of physics were failing. So what happened is that during it was it was that the, the Newton's laws of motion when taken close to the speed of light is something which is not consistent. Also, Einstein was influenced by the idea that there is nothing called an absolute reference frame in the rest of the universe. So Einstein proposed this special relativity in 1905. It is introduced by the concept of the law that the laws of physics are the same for all observers in uniform motion. Now, when we tell, tell that the laws of motions are same for the universal, uh, for uniform motion, that means what we are doing is that we are trying to mention something which is invariant in nature. Now, this term invariant has got a lot of implications which we are going to cover slowly one by one. Okay, so from here we understood that there is a specific need for a special theory of relativity because the constants your speed of light, the classical mechanics, things moving close to the speed of light are not going well with the classical laws. That means there is a dearth, there is a problem. The certain areas are not matching with the classical mechanics. So obviously, if there is a problem, we need to find a new theory. And that is actually the theory of special relativity. Now, before coming to special relativity, what we also found out is that from Galilean relativity or from the, even prior to that, uh, Nicholas Copernicus, etc., when we start moving from one physics law to another, we find there is something which is called a transformation, something which requires a change, something which needs to be extended, modified, or entirely replaced. So the question is that I am speaking of the general transformation, not any specific equational transformation. Question is that why do we need these transformations? Why do we need that things needs to become come up? Let us look up in the next part of our lecture today. So here is a nice diagram which tells that the laws of physics which are happening at one frame of reference has to be equal to the laws of physics on the other frame of reference. So what we can say is that a way to relate the observation of different observers. Also, observers in these vehicles need to describe the law of motion. So whatever the observation is on a truck, it needs to be described uh, on that of an aeroplane. Or we need to help to understand relative motions. So this is particularly important because in scenarios involving moving objects or systems such as celestial bodies, etc., these things are required. That means there is a requirement of transformation from one set of laws of physics to another frame reference, from one observer to another observer, from one relative motion to another relative motion. So this actually brings us to an idea that, yes, we need a kind of a transformation. We have not decided or we have not come to the opinion what kind of a transformation, but definitely one thing is quite same, uh, quite significant, that the laws of physics should be invariant to all the observers. Now, here you see this is a kind of a pictorial diagram which tells you that when we are uh, talking of transformation, we are moving from Galilean transformation to Lorentzian transformation. We are moving from a flat space to a curved space. So all, the, all these requires a transformation rule. It requires an exotic component called tensors, which is very central to general relativity, which we are going to dis uh, discuss. Also, as you see, the Maxwell's equation, which is just below the Galileo's photograph, you can see that this is something uh, I would say uh, this is again has been uh, a modified to relativistic Maxwell's equation. As you can see, this F mu nu are basically the tensor components. And also the state vector in a kind of a spin up state, spin up basis, once it gets generalized to the state vector of a spin down basis, how the transformations actually takes place. That means what we understood is that in order to measure something and in order to make the basic thing same, we need something which are called transformations. So what we found out from there that yes, we need transformation because the laws of physics has to be invariant. Second is that 
a GPS satellite, for example, requires transformation of equations to convert to their own coordinates because GPS satellite is something which is right on the top and this would require the earth center coordinates. Also, transformation equals uh, helps us to enable to compare the observations. I mean to say how uh, we actually made a kind of a comparison with this frame of reference and that. We also need transformation equations so that we can allow us to work with the same system in different ways using different coordinate systems. So these are, you know, some basic ideas that why do we need a transformation? Now, why I am defining transformation? Because I before, we, if, if, if I do not mention you why we need the transformation, then the transformation that is required from Galilean to special relativity or so on, you won't be able to understand. So you see here the transformation equations uh, are actually fundamental tools of physics that ensures what the consistency, that means the laws of physics are consistent. Predictability, obviously we need a mathematical model so that we can predict and versatility. That means all are being defined in one of our understanding of the physical world. So this is actually kind of a summary that why do we need transformations? So one of the most primitive, I won't say primitive, but the basic, uh, you know, concept of transformation actually came from Galileo when he found that this is, again, non-relativistic transformation, but he found out that how we can define the laws of physics, which are moving from one frame of reference and it is going to the other frame of reference. So for that, as you see here, that if I'm doing an experiment in one coordinate system and if I'm going experiment in other coordinate system, this result, if it is x, it has to be x. That means the laws of physics are same in all initial frames of reference. And it allows us to describe, to understand how events and objects appear differently when observed from different viewpoints. The significance of Galilean transformation actually shows that they provide a way to compare the results of experiments in, in a different inertial frames. Remember that when you're talking of special relativity or anything else, what we are talking is about only inertial frames of reference. That means those which are moving with uniform velocity. The moment we move into non-inertial frames of reference, things would change. So from here, you see, I am not telling the mathematics. It is quite simple. So you've got a coordinate S and S prime. And this equations actually tells that how Galilean transformation happens. So these transformation, remember, they're only and only true for bodies or objects or particles which are moving less than the speed of light. So Galilean velocity transformations actually shows out this. So this is a kind of a schematic diagram that if I am standing right on the train, I'm throwing a ball. So the ball will just vertically go up and fall for the person standing in the train, but somebody was standing outside, the ball would appear to travel in a parabola. This actually shows Galilean transformation, how these two transformations or the laws of motions are different. So from the perspective of an observer, Standing on the ground, the ball travels in a parabolic way. This is because the observer in the ground is moving relative to the train. So here is just a sign, kind of an, uh, I would say, not a warning, but a note that all the uh, scientific theories, we cannot just tell that Galileo was wrong, taken up by Newton. Newton was wrong, by taken up by Einstein, and so on. So here is a video which is called Scientific Theories Right and Wrong. You can go ahead and watch where I've talked about, can we really talk about a scientific theory to be right or a scientific theory to be wrong? I have seen a lot of people, especially students, discard Newton, discard Einstein, something like that. And I think this is not a, it is a very misnomer. It should not be taken up in that way. Each particular scientific theory has its own limitation, own time, own social and cultural, I would say, effects on that. And we cannot tell that uh, a scientific theory is right and wrong without judging uh, what are the implications of that? So if we now tell that Newton was right and Galileo was wrong, so that then, uh, you know, the laws of transformation from Galileo went to relativity, and then you call, uh, uh, you know, Einstein to be wrong, maybe the string theory or quantum physics to be right. So there is nothing called right and wrong, de depending upon the technology, mathematical evolution, evolution of human brain, as scientific theory takes place, then it gets modified or the, it gets further added up. So there's nothing which is called a right or a wrong. Each scientific theory is excellent in its own phase. So we come to the next part, which is called the michelson molly experiment, which actually took off the concept of the, what we call the luminiferous ether. So sound waves and then James Rowe Claxwell's light is an electromagnetic wave. So if you do this kind of an experiment, I have just given the uh, diagram. 
So if you rotate the system, that means if I, then the influence of the wind, ether wind should change the, I would say, the times of the light beams to take travel along. That means it, it will be either faster, mostly slower. So it was assumed that it is an ether which propagates light waves. This ether was assumed to be everywhere and, uh, and unaffected by matter. That means even matter was uh, thought to be unaffected. This was a belief during that time. So what it found out here is very important. The experiment performed at different times of the year. Now, why it is performed in different times of the year? Because the Earth's motion, et cetera, would change as per the, you know, winter, summer, et cetera. So it was to make things absolutely perfect. It was made into different part of the year. So no change in the interference pattern was observed. The conclusion of the michelson molly experiment was that they, it could not detect anything like ether. Now, this this idea of Michelson's Molly experiment, there's nothing called ether. Actually, it was the genius of Albert Einstein. He took the result at once uh, and he proposed in the development of special theory of relativity. Now, the question is that how did Einstein took up Michelson's Molly experiment and how did he framed what is known as one of the postulates of special relativity? Let us look into the next part. So here you see that if I take the experiment or the apparatus at itself, first it tells the conclusion of the michelson molly experiment was that there is no measurable difference in the speed of light. That means there is no difference at all. And what is the principle of relativity? You see how, how genius, how quickly Einstein takes up the result from there and how he posits it as nothing but a postulate. So because it showed that, that there is no measurable difference in the speed of light, Logically, if we go, we find that Einstein posited that the laws of physics are the same for all initial observers. Simple, why? Because the highest speed on Earth or whatever we detect is the speed of light. So if the speed of light is constant, then the laws of physics would be same because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. I'm just saying it is not mathematical. See the logical development of thoughts, meaning that the fundamental principle of physics are consistent. From there, he found that Einstein realized that the only way to explain the results of the experiment was to abandon the concept of the ether and to postulate that the speed of light is constant in all frames of reference. That means, you see, it is not that he framed the equation. It is not that he framed something mathematical. But based on the principle that Michelson's Molly experiment is showing that there is nothing called ether and there is no difference in light, and because there is no difference in the in the speed of the light that is why the speed of light is constant and because nothing can travel speed uh, faster than the speed of light that means the laws of physics are same for all initial observers because nothing can move faster than the speed of light that is the limit so you see i mean to say that is what i tried to show you that it is the michelson molly's experiment of the non-existence of luminiferous ether uh, logically was taken up by einstein to frame what is called the first postulate so C, as you see on the left-hand side, in the michelson molly experiment, the fact the speed of light was the same in all directions means that the speed of light is a fundamental constant. It is not affected. Okay, let me just uh, put up my uh, Google, uh, this Jamboard, because I really want to show you something from here, which is not obviously included in here. Uh, just let me show you one thing. Uh, once we will move up further in terms of special theory of relativity, we are going. We we we, we will see some equations. I'm just to try trying to show you. I'm not ready with this, so it it will be something like this: c square d t square. Say for example, plus I can take. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sharing this one. I'm so sorry. Let me share. Present share screen. Sorry. Uh, present share screen. No, no, no. Hmm. Oh, yes, and um, because, yeah. So here comes the jam board. So you see here, uh, once we will be, uh, you know, looking into this kind of right now, I'm not explained. So it would be say d square x plus, uh, sorry, dx squared plus dy squared, I'm sorry of my horrible handwriting, plus dz squared, something like that. I mean, to see, we are going to look into this. And also, we will look into an equation when there is no minus sign, or we will just see c squared. I'm so sorry to take a 
this part, right? And uh, better one. Yeah, C square, I think this is better. DT square, then plus this one, plus this one, plus this one. Now you see, I will explain to you, this is something which is called a space time interval. But what is very important in this is that this C square, which is coming over here, and this C square with a negative sign, which is coming over here, these will be, you know, constants in the uh, equation of a space-time interval. That means if I take something like an x and y axis, and if this is an event, say, for example, I call it E1, and there is another event, which is called E2, and here is an observer O standing here over here, and another observer O prime standing over here. Whatever the event that is taking place over here would be observed in the same way with the observer over here, O prime observer. Now you see, when, when we will deal with Lorentz transformation, we will see this C, this is not always the, the speed of light, but this is a kind of a constant. Now you might say, why this constant is there? That is a very good question. Why this constant is there? Because in certain cases, when we will see the distances between two particular events, this and this, then that this temporal and the spatial distance, I mean to say, say for example, time, if I take an S as the spatial distance, then this is nothing but this C. That is the speed of light, this C. Why this C is equated with time, we will come to know. But remember, this C is not always a numerical C, but this is just a constant. This is just a constant in order to make the difference between this event and this event be constant. That means there is no change. It is called a space-time interval, which is invariant. So whenever we see a C, Remember, it is not always that we're equating with the speed of light, but maybe this C is a K, which is a constant. And we have to equate this so that we can get something which is invariant. That means the laws of physics are the same. The laws of physics are the same. Anyway, so we will come to that part later. It just come, came out of my mind. So I just thought to share with you. So th this is, uh, you know, uh, something very important. But Michelson's model experiment, which discarded the concept of ether, also logically was taken up by Einstein to prove that the speed of light was the same in all direction. That means that light is a fundamental constant. As you see, it is a fundamental constant and the postulate of the speed of light is constant in all frames of reference. That means if I again share my jam board, you will see that whatever the equations that we frame over here, this C, which will follow with other equations, for example, dx square plus dy square. I mean, now remember in that, in this case, what is going to happen? This d, I can call it as delta because it is a finite distance. I can call it as this delta. And this delta, this x2 is nothing but the difference between two intervals that is x2 minus x1. Then again, it can be y2 minus y1 and so on. That means taking a particular equation in special theory of relativity, we would plug in this C somewhere around this. I'm not saying maybe here, maybe here, maybe here, just to maintain that the distance between two intervals are basically equated with the time T and with the constant C. So everywhere you will find this CT coming up in special relativity. Remember, it is not a particular, I mean to say, not a mathematical trick. But if, if this C would have not been incorporated with the time, then the distance between two would have been different. Einstein told that the speed of light is constant. So if it is constant, then for every temporal event between this and this, it has to be constant. This is something very important. Uh, I have not included in the slide, so I always feel a board. I don't have a whiteboard <laughs> over here. So it is always better to explain uh, in this part. So that is all for today's video. I will start with Lorentz transformation, not today, uh, not tomorrow. Uh, I mean to say we have to start that uh, on Monday or Tuesday because tomorrow I've got the general relativity webinar uh, from 8 o'clock evening. And then again on Sunday, Dr. Devanjan Bose is coming. Uh, things will be, uh, you know, from the evening 8 o'clock onwards. So I will start up next time, uh, maybe on Monday or Tuesday, but I will be regularly coming. So you see this something new came up that the constancy of the speed of light, how it is equated with that equation. I'm not showing the space-time interval right now, to be very honest, because I'm taking a very 
baby step to explore general relativity. I will cover up the entire special relativity I have to cover because this channel is only for general theory of relativity. So special relativity, space-time interval, Minkowski metric, time dilation, everything will be covered. And then we will take a step-by-step -step going into general relativity. But because it is not a usual, uh, what I would say, uh, you know, a school level or a grad level course. So time and again, these new things will come up. So it is not a usual learning. It is a kind of a different learning. And I hope you're enjoying this learning. Please do put up your comment in the comment box. And uh, I will put up in the, uh, the, in, the, in the community section also of this channel that when I'm coming next, request you to share this video as much as you can so that people can really enjoy the live classes. Thank you very much. We'll be back soon. Take care and may the good Lord be with you.